We boarded the Irish ferry at Pembroke Dock, Milford Haven, destination Rosslare in Ireland, where Leslie was to relive a childhood holiday visiting the locations of a film called Ryan's Daughter. Admiral Nelson loved this harbour and called it one of the greatest harbours in the world. It is one of the deepest natural harbours in the world. The Haven imports a large quantity of natural gas and oil and supplies a good part of the UK's energy needs. But it is also a home to pleasure boats of all sorts. During World War II, the Haven was home to the largest seaplane base ever. Here, Milford Haven enters into the Bristol Channel that boasts one of the largest tidal ranges in the world, and that in turn empties into the Irish Sea. Once into the Irish Sea, our ferry turns and sets a course for Rosslare in Ireland. It's a short four-hour journey. Whilst heading to Rosslare, our final destination in Ireland is of course County Kerry in the west, where they made the film Ryan's Daughter. Arriving at Rosser, just south of Wexford there, as mariners, we simply could not resist heading towards Hook Point, where we could find the oldest operational lighthouse in the world. Even 800 years ago, it was decided that this dangerous coast demanded some form of aid to navigation. The result was this lighthouse built by monks. It was powered by simple wood bonfires. Being operational, the top of the lighthouse is out of bounds, but this model shows a Fresnel lens system that's used today. Remarkably, the structure of this lighthouse is still the original structure built by the monks. It features amazingly thick stone walls of some four meters. That's about 13 feet. Unusual for a lighthouse, each level is a self-contained system with a ceiling. And still today, you can see the small prayer rooms at each level. Ireland is just littered with history. And as we left the lighthouse, we quickly came upon this medieval church ruin. It's now in a pretty bad state, but we are fascinated to find out that inside the ruin, there are graves. It seems as a hierarchy, the more privileged people are buried inside the church and the less privileged outside, but it's still used as a graveyard today. Intending to cruise island in Sully one day, we just could not resist visiting small harbors to scout them out. And while still in Wexford, we found this one. I don't think that means you shouldn't exceed five kilometers an hour when falling into the harbor. It's island, so this little harbor comes complete with its own castle. Well, that's just too narrow to get Sullier into that inner harbor. Slade Castle is not open to the public, but it does have its uses. Today, lobster pots are stored in its yard. It's still a home for a few crab and lobster boats, as well as a few small fishing boats. I think Sullier may just manage it into that outer harbour. Around the year 1200, the Earl of Pembroke was caught in a storm off the Wexford coast. He vowed that if rescued, he'd build an abbey. Clearly he was rescued, 
This is The Abbey. Over the years, Tintern Abbey has seen many changes. On this elevation, you can clearly see three distinct phases of building. This was its gradual transformation to the Tintern Abbey that we see before us today. Set in these beautiful surroundings, we took our time exploring. We cross this beautiful rare 16th century bridge with its distinctive crenellations. With one last look back at the Abbey, we made our way to the nearby walled gardens. Being a passionate gardener, I could spend hours looking at each of these wonderful plants. But I know that all too soon, Paul will have to drag me away. Yes, as beautiful as Wexford was, our final destination was in the west of Ireland. It was now time to head west, with our ultimate destination being the Dingle Peninsula. Initially basing ourselves in Killarney, we thought we'd first explore the Ring of Kerry, which promised some fantastic scenery. We began our tour at Ross Castle, a castle sitting alongside a large loch and a very popular place for tourists. Here, to explore the loch, you can either choose your own rowing boat and set yourself free, or take a guided tour. Above all, it's the incredible coastline that makes the Ring of Kerry so famous. We spent a marvellous day exploring the Ring of Kerry. But just over there was the Dingle Peninsula, our ultimate destination, and the place where much of Ryan's daughter was filmed. And that is what we had come for. The Dingle Peninsula is the nearest part of Europe to the United States. It's a beautiful part of the world that Leslie visited and fell in love with when she was just 11. Visiting the film sets chosen by David Lean the director of Ryan's Daughter, was an excellent way of showing off the majesty of this beautiful part of the world. So in the film Ryan's Daughter, the tower behind me uh, sets a scene for the first meeting of Major Dorian and Rosie Ryan, their first guilty assignation on the hilltop here. It's hard to imagine what sort of emotions they were going through guilt, passion, and where the passion took over, the story leads on. For this scene, this beautiful stretch of sand jutting out from the Dingle Peninsula was chosen. So today we find our way to another location for the filming of Ryan's Daughter. This is called Inch Strand in the Kerry Peninsula. And this is the scene where Rosie has met Shaughnessy on the beach and she's walking away very tearfully. She thinks she's been rejected when he's called her a child. So she's walking away and he says, Rosie, what's the matter? And she said, nothing, I have something in my eye. And she tearfully walks away, wiping a tear from her eye. So this is quite an unexpected location for the filming of Ryan's Daughter. Maybe you haven't seen the film, but there's a beautiful bluebell wood where Rosie Ryan and Major Dorian make love for the first time. It's bluebells, dandelions drifting on the breeze, and it was actually filmed inside Muriach Village Hall that stands behind me. It was so beautifully converted that nobody's ever noticed. Uh, but around here they still speak Gaelic or Gaelic, and uh, nobody had a clue that that scene was filmed inside this hall. But we knew. 
So this is the scene where O'Leary's captured by the soldiers. His vehicle comes up here, turns the corner, and they're waiting for him with this impressive backshot of Brandon Mountain behind him. It's incredible how many different locations they used. How did they come up with this specific location for that particular scene? We'll never know. Some of the storm scene was filmed here at Cuminor Beach. This is where the IRA supply boat launched rafts of guns and explosives into a raging sea. So fierce were the waves that the IRA was struggling to retrieve these armaments. Then lo and behold, the whole village, every man, woman and child came running down the ramp to rescue this deadly cargo. The film set of Carreri village took over a year to build on this lonely windswept hillside. So this cobble street is all that remains of the village of Carreri. This hillside sets the scene of a lonely village with a people poverty stricken and narrow minded and guided very much by religion. When I came in 1969 as a child, I picked up relics, but, but now this is all that remains. The filming studio offered the site as a tourist industry to the local people here, but this commonage belonged to several people, and because they couldn't decide who should get the royalties from it, the whole, the whole set was laid flat. Uh, it seems sad, but in some ways, it's, it's good that it's over. In 1845, the potato famine hit Ireland, and in particular, it hit this area. It hit this area because the poor in this area 100% depended on potatoes for their diet, with the men having to eat as much as 14 pounds of potatoes a day in order to get the nutrients they needed to survive and work. So when the potato blight hit the potatoes, the people here simply starved. And the British government, even though it was the most powerful government in the world at the time, didn't really do a lot to help. The result was there was mass emigration. And in fact, that emigration was carrying on right up into the 60s, into the 1960s. And as one family wrote, after the film came and injected so much money into the area, they were able to buy a tractor. And instead of their children constantly having to emigrate to America, they could now stay and farm the land. In fact, the film industry didn't just do that, it also created a tourist industry, and this area is now totally pretty well dependent on a booming tourist industry, and deservingly so, because it's an area of warm people and absolutely fantastic countryside. As Leslie had visited the Dingle Peninsula some 46 years ago as a child, she could not help returning to one of those childish memories before we left the Dingle. Something that remains the same from my 1969 visit to Southern Ireland, when I was age about 11, 12, are the fuchsia hedges. Everywhere we've driven this time, along the roadside, across the fields, you find these beautiful fuchsia hedges with a glow of red you can see stretching up into the hillside. Not only do they leave the fuchsia hedges alone, they allow the wildflowers to grow. So here we've got vetches, yellow, purple. We've even found a pyramidal orchid. There's dog roses, clover, and they're all just left to grow beautifully. Uh, it's like a wildflower garden. Perfect. The amazing thing about this fuchsia is that it was first introduced from Chile. And it was found to grow so well here that they, it slowly reproduced. And it kept taking cuttings until they, it spread right across the county of Kerry. Um, that's why you find so many beautiful hedgerows made of fuchsia. OK, the Dingle Peninsula owes much to the film Ryan's daughter. It kick-started the tourist industry. But when we were there, we discovered that there was another individual that the tourist industry in Dingle owed much to. And that individual was not a human. It was a dolphin called Fungi. <laughs> OK, John, we've come into the area and we're fascinated to see that there seems to be a whole tourist industry that's been built around one dolphin called Fungi. Exactly. And as we walked into the marina here, we were told, oh, you need to speak to Dolphin John. <laughs> and the next thing we know, you're walking past. So have you got a little bit of time to tell us the story of Fungi? 
Um, certainly. Uh, it, it, back in 1983 was when the dolphin first appeared in Dingle Harbour. And he, at that time, he, he was simply, he was to escort the fishing boats mm. out, in, out to the fishing in the morning and in the afternoon, in the evening then when they'd be coming home, he'd escort them back in again. Now, that was in the, the fall of 1983. But in 1984 then, uh, it was the first time that we encountered him in the water. How that arose was that my hobby is scuba diving. Okay. And to, uh, our, the, the organisation that we are affiliated to is the Irish Underwater Council. And we have to do a certain number of snorkels before we go scuba diving just to get water fit again. And my daughter also scuba dives, Dared is her name, she also scuba dives. And down by our own house, there's a, a nice little beach, it's called Bean Bawn. And we went down there and we started to do our snorkel out towards Bean Bawn headland. We were swimming out towards this headland anyway, and suddenly the dolphin, who was normally over on the opposite side of the harbour, appeared over with us and he stayed with us for the, uh, all the time while we were swinging back into the beach again, which was a period of maybe a half an hour. Mm -hmm. So that was our first encounter with him. So did you feel that the dolphin made any approach to you? Certainly, because it was actually he that came to us rather than we go looking for him. Now we knew he was around all right, but we never envisaged he coming along and swimming with us, you see. So after that then, as I say, I, I, I'm affiliated to, to Trulisa Backwood Club, who are in turn affiliated with the Irish Underwater Council. And I informed the guys inside in Trulie then that this dolphin came over to us and we had him for a full half hour on the swim back. And uh, it, it was a, a man by the name of Ronnie Fitzgibbon, that's Noel's brother who's, who's down there at the moment now. I told him about it and he brought a few more of the boys out, boys and girls I mm -hmm. suppose also, and uh, we, we, we continued swimming with him and for the next four or five years he was a regular visitor with us on all our scuba dives. So how close does Fungi like to get to you? Does he sort of come up and interact with you at all? In, in the beginning he, he come right up to you. He, um, I, as a matter of fact I have some pictures at home of him where he comes so close to you that he, he was like a pet dog in actual fact. You could scratch him and he was, he, as I say, like a dog, he'd push up to you to <laughs> scratch him even harder. And, and you'd hear guys saying when, when they got home in the evening time after being with him for a, a, a dive that, that his flesh was under their fingernails <laughs> from, the, from the, the, the scratching, you see. And uh, then, you know, out on the dive, in actual fact, at times he was a bit of a nuisance to you, really, because he'd stick his, his <laughs> nose in under your arm and say, for God's sake, Funky, will you go away, like, you know? <laughs> and and, and just, or, or, or he'd catch your fin or something like that. And you'd you think you were after getting your fin stuck <laughs> on, on, on a, a, a rock or something like that. You'd find it was the dolphin had you, uh, 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 you, you, you were filling his mouth, yes. Um, and then he, he was like that for several years. But then uh, suddenly he, he just gave up. It's, it's, you'd still see him in the water at times, but he wouldn't come near you. Nothing uh, uh, as, uh, as good as in the first few years that he was there. So do you have any idea why he stopped coming up to you? I haven't really, but I, we, we, we reckon that, that some person or whatever uh, interfered with him somewhere or other that, that turned him off swimming with, with uh, people. That's as, that's as much as I can come up with, really. It's a shame. We've heard, ha however, that he does like to swim up to other boats. Yes, he, he, he does that quite regularly, all right. Um, th there are... There are some boats that he seems to prefer more than others, um, particularly the smaller boats. There's a local sailing club here now, and they go out in, in their little oppies, um, mm -hmm. lasers, that sort of thing. And uh, he, he really 
gets great satisfaction out of playing around with them. Mm -hmm. But still, you, you know, it, it, from my point of view, it's, it's diving. Yes. And uh, as I say, it's, it's regularly, it's, it's not very regular now that you'll actually see him under the water anymore. Mm. It's an awful pity really, because he, he, even in, those, in the earlier times, this, this beach that I was telling you about, you'd have children down there in the beach, you know, young children or maybe 10, 12 years of age. And he'd come in and swim around the children mm. so much so that, that even they, uh, they'd only be up to their waist in the water and they could even rub him down. Oh, but that's all gone now for mm. whatever happened, I don't know. What a fantastic experience. It, it, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah, it would have been, yeah. So we noticed in the bay here that there's a, a lot of industry going on around Fungi where they're offering day trips out in the boat and they guarantee a sighting or your money back. Now, how does that work? How does that come about? It, 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 it works fine. I, and, and I don't think anybody ever yet got their money back, to be quite honest <laughs> about it. Because he's, he's, he, 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 in the summertime, wintertime, he's there all the time. And you, you'd wonder, like, why doesn't he uh, go away again? It's, 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 it's most unusual for a dolphin to stay in a harbour for as long as he has. Mm -hmm. Um, in other parts of the world, dolphins come in and they stay for maybe a year or two years. In England, in Australia and all that, they, they have records of that. But none of them has stayed more than four or five years at the very most. But this guy is here since 1983. Um, but I, 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 you ask about the, the industry then uh, uh, that's built around him. Um, all, all the shops and, and uh, the, the restaurants, uh, the bed and breakfast, the hotels, they all capitalise on him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, more people then will say, well, he's being exploited. But he's not being mm -hmm. exploited. In my opinion, anyway, he's not being exploited. Simply because there are no chains on him. He can go away if yeah. he wants. He's not like the dolphin that's inside in, the, in an aquarium, something to that effect. He's there all year. He can come and go as he please. Um, you'll have... Um, shoals of dolphin come in there, at least one shoal will come in every year, maybe two and sometimes even three every year. And he'll swim around with those for maybe a, a, a week, a month, two months, and yet they'll go way off when they get tired of the place and he still he stays, stays here. Home. It's most unusual. And now I'm no expert on, on dolphin behaviour or, or, or anything as such, but Nobody can explain why he's staying around. It's very difficult to, to, to say. But no doubt you're very glad to have Fungi around. Oh, he, yes. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, well, financially he does, uh, I'd say, he, the, the, the tourist <laughs> industry in Dingle wouldn't be as good only for him. You know? And uh, I mean, it, 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 going back to, to well, it was, uh, 84, I suppose, when the, when, the, when the first boats were bringing people out, but they're still coming by the droves, you know. All the win all the year round, even the winter period, the boats take people out to see him. So you'd recommend that we go and get a boat trip and go out to see him and meet Fungi? Uh, and meet him, certainly, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> we'll or even to. even if you had uh, your your uh, uh, wetsuit or something and put that yes, on, and, and if you were lucky, you, you'd, oh. you, you may see him under the water also. That's a lovely thought. <laughs> it is. Thank you yes, very much, John. You're very Thank welcome. You. Thank yes, you. you're very welcome. So, just as it was for David Lean, our time here in Southern Ireland has been severely hampered by the weather. Uh, each day we've tried to film and the weather has kept us guessing. This Pacamac has been my best friend. Uh, we've been through sunshine, but mostly through rain, heavy rain, light rain, 40 kilometres an hour winds, and we've decided it's our time to go, and mainly because there's another three days of extremely hard rain coming. So we've had a wonderful time in Dingle. I've I've really enjoyed doing the Rosie Ryan Trail and following Ryan's daughter. Um, it's strange being back after 46 years. Some things have changed, some things have not. But I do sort of realise that after 46 years, really, Ryan's daughter is kind of fading, whilst the tourist industry here has boomed since Ryan's daughter and continues to do so. So something good has still come from it. So it's been a wonderful time. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>